All right. Uh, so you've joined PHRC's Fair Housing and Power Hour. This is part of a monthly webinar series uh, that seeks to ensure that everyone has uh, the basic fair housing knowledge that they need to be successful as they navigate the housing world. So we just have an hour. This is a basic introduction. But if you're interested in more in-depth training, please feel free to, uh, to reach out. I'm happy to get that set up for you. So we will be sending out the slides from today's presentation, as well as the link to the recording. Uh, so uh, please know that you'll get all of this information as well as some additional fair housing resources. Um, today's session is going to be interactive, so please feel free to, to use the chat. Thank you to everyone who's introduced themselves and said hi in the chat so far. And if you have questions, uh, please know that I'm monitoring the chat as well and we'll uh, attempt to uh, answer all of your questions that we can either as the presentation goes on or at the end because we are planning to have some Q&A time. So our topic today um, is Fair Housing Rights for LGBTQ Individuals. Uh, we're going to start um, by going over um, who the PHRC is as an agency. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Fair Housing Basics, so the laws that form the Fair Housing Protections uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the journey to fair housing protections uh, for LGBTQ individuals. We're going to talk about what acts are discriminatory and what discrimination looks like uh, before we share information about what you can do if you're experiencing housing discrimination. And then, as I mentioned, at the end, we always uh, do have time to, to answer uh, your fair housing questions. So the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, uh, we often refer to it as PHRC. Uh, so this is the leading civil rights enforcement agency uh, in, the, in the state of Pennsylvania. And we work to ensure that everyone can live, work, and learn free from discrimination all across the Commonwealth. Uh, we're an independent agency. Uh, we've been around since 1955, and our mission has two parts, uh, both to enforce our laws, which include uh, the Pennsylvania uh, Human Relations Act and the Pennsylvania Fair Educational Opportunities Act. And when individuals believe that they have experienced discrimination in the areas under our jurisdiction, uh, they can file a complaint with PHRC, and then we'll have trained neutral investigators investigate those claims to determine if there was probable cause of discrimination. So we also work to, uh, to broadly promote uh, equal opportunities for all. So we work in partnerships with various governmental agencies, with community benefit organizations and social justice uh, organizations and others. Uh, we also have advisory councils and ambassadors that are active in our communities and they're comprised of community volunteers that work to advance um, PHRC's work in, in local counties, cities, towns, uh, really communities uh, all throughout the Commonwealth. You can see here a map uh, of our area. Uh, we cover the entire state of Pennsylvania. So the western part of the state is covered by our Pittsburgh office. Uh, the central and northeastern part of the state is covered by our Harrisburg office. And then the south central or southeastern part of uh, the state is covered by our Pittsburgh office. Uh, so I, I'd like to invite everyone to drop in the chat uh, what part of the state you're, you're joining from. What regional office covers uh, where you live or work? And while folks are doing that, I'm going to keep moving on through. Uh, so I mentioned our walls uh, earlier. Here's what they cover. So the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act covers employment, housing, commercial properties, uh, public accommodations, as well as primary and secondary education. And then the Pennsylvania Fair Educational Opportunities Act covers post-secondary education. Uh, we've got housing bolded on the slide here because that's what we're talking uh, about today. All right, so that was a very brief overview of our agency and what we do. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk specifically about fair housing. Um, so what is fair housing? It's a system of laws that ensure that, uh, that groups of people are protected from discrimination. And in protecting groups by prohibiting uh, discriminatory practices, fair housing initiatives uh, work to establish housing and housing practices that support all of us, uh, because we know that housing is foundational to thriving communities. Uh, we've got multiple layers of uh, fair housing protection. So we've got laws at the federal, at the state, and the local levels. 
So if you, if you use the uh, analogy of a house, then because we're talking about housing today, uh, the federal laws create the foundation uh, for fair housing protections. So those laws include uh, the Fair Housing Act passed in 1968, uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which actually just happened this month, and then uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act passed in 1991. So our state law, the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, provides uh, the walls. It further expands on the protections uh, established uh, by uh, um, by the, the federal protections, uh, some additional protected classes, which you'll see in just a moment. And then uh, lastly, the local levels uh, implement even further protections in local communities. So you can think of those as the roof. So there are over 70 different ordinances throughout the state. You can check and see uh, what's uh, what's present at your at your local level. So an example of this uh, would be source of income protection. Uh, we don't have source of income protection uh, that would uh, protect individuals who have a Section 8 voucher or other types of housing assistance or income. We don't have that at the state or federal level, but several uh, several local areas areas uh, throughout the state, including Philadelphia, State College, uh, Erie, uh, do have this, uh, this protection. And that gives them an, uh, a more equal shot at housing. Uh, so many local municipalities uh, did uh, have uh, did pass housing protections based on sexual orientation and gender identity prior to uh, to the state and federal uh, protections being passed. Uh, so we know that our fair housing laws didn't just happen out of the blue, didn't happen in a vacuum. They were put into place through the tireless work of uh, many housing leaders and advocates uh, because our house, our country has a history of exclusionary housing practices, laws and structures. Uh, there are historical practices that have been compounded by both governmental and, uh, and private actors. And although these discriminatory housing practices have been outlawed for over 50 years, there's much more work that needs to be done as we work to dismantle patterns of segregation and promote uh, more diverse and inclusive communities in a real and tangible way. So we call this work affirmatively furthering fair housing. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, goal number one and the housing discrimination and acts of discrimination, uh, but we also uh, believe very strongly in the need to affirmatively further fair housing. And you can see the definition on the screen here which includes taking meaningful actions in addition to combating uh, discrimination to, that overcome patterns of segregation and foster inclusive communities that are free from barriers that restrict access to opportunity based on protected characteristics. Uh, and we do have uh, more intensive training uh, on affirmability for furthering fair housing or NFFH uh, that, that you can access at, an, at another time. So what do our our fair housing laws actually do? Well, they uh, they prohibit discrimination in the sale, rental, uh, and housing-related transactions. So when we talk about housing-related transactions, that refers to uh, the financing of homes, uh, the appraising of homes, uh, getting renters and homeowners insurance, all of those industries that kind of surround and support uh, the rental and home buying process. Fair housing laws cover the vast majority of, of types of housing including apartments, single family homes, uh, manufactured home uh, communities, condominiums, public housing, nursing homes, dormitories, even some types of uh, emergency shelter. Uh, <clears throat> and when we talk about the types of housing discrimination, falls into two main theories, disparate treatment, which directly discriminates against a, a member of a, a protected class, the disparate impact, uh, which is a policy that appears to be neutral and fair, um, but that would have a disproportionate impact on a member of a protected class. So an example would be a uh, disparate treatment, uh, a housing provider refusing to renew a lease because they find out that the two male tenants are in a romantic relationship and are not just roommates. Whereas disparate impact would be a policy, say, that a tenant's name that they use has, has, to, uh, has to match what's on their, their legal documents. This policy doesn't cite anything about sexual orientation and gender identity, but it's going to have a disproportionate impact on transgender tenants who often encounter numerous obstacles in uh, updating their name and their sex and their, their identification documents uh, to match their identity. All right. 
families. So now we're gonna move on to talk about protected classes. So who has these protections under fair housing laws? Uh, we call them protected classes. Before I go on to show you uh, them on the screen, I'd like to see how many we can identify in the chat. So please take a second and enter your thoughts in the chat. Um, uh, can you provide an example of a protected class? I know I've got a lot of my colleagues on this call here today, so I think we can get them all. Okay, we've got sex, uh, age, 40 and above, absolutely. What else? Religion, ancestry, yep, at the state level, uh, race. Anyone else? Familial status, absolutely. Disability, definitely. All right, so let's, let's move on. I'd like to, to highlight just a, a few uh, differences between uh, the protected classes at the federal level and the protected classes at the state level. Uh, so you'll see that there's a lot of similarities. Uh, at the federal level, you've got race, color, national origin, familial status, religion, sex, and disability. And then uh, at the Pennsylvania Human Relations Act, you've got uh, basically all of the above, um, race, color, national origin, familial status, religious creed, sex, uh, disability, uh, age 40 and above, ancestry, as well as uh, the use, handling, or training of support animals uh, for, um, for disability. And if you live in an area with uh, a local ordinance, as I mentioned, uh, there may be even further additional uh, protected classes that are available in your area. Let's offer a brief uh, clarification on familial status. It includes three groups of people. So families with children under the age of 18 that are living with their parents or legal custodians, uh, people who are pregnant, as well as people who are securing custody uh, of children uh, who are under the age of 18, which includes foster children. All right, there's one exception to that, and that's for, uh, uh, for senior living facilities. So these are specific communities for older adults that have uh, been set up for the specific purpose of, of housing seniors. There are two types, uh, 55 and older communities, as well as 62 and older communities. Uh, so if a housing community meets all of the criteria for one of these two types of, uh, of senior housing, uh, they may uh, refuse to rent families with children. And you can find more information on that in the Housing for Older Persons Act. I'd like to define disability as well, uh, and that's a uh, physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of a person's major life activities. Uh, so uh, some examples of that include caring for oneself, walking, seeing, hearing, speaking, breathing, learning, or working. And the Fair Housing Act protects those who have a disability, who have a history of a disability, as well as those who are perceived as having a disability. Uh, so I just want to note that um, that if someone has a disability, it may not be something uh, that's immediately observable on meeting someone and talking with them. It might be something that you don't know unless it's disclosed. Uh, but regardless of whether it's something that's observable or non-observable, uh, as long as they would meet uh, the definition of having one or more of their major life activities be substantially limited, uh, they would qualify for these protections. All right, well, thank you for bearing with me as we kind of laid the groundwork uh, for our discussion today, um, housing protect uh, protections for LGBTQ Pennsylvanians. So you will notice that when I displayed the list of protected classes, you didn't see sexual orientation or gender identity listed under either the federal or the state level. But that does not mean that, that there are no housing protections uh, for these individuals. So these uh, protections lie under the protected class of sex. So sex has been a protected class under the PHRA since 1969, um, but the commission has recently established that the definition uh, may refer to the characteristics uh, on the slide. 
which includes uh, pregnancy status, uh, childbirth status, breastfeeding status, sex assigned at birth, gender identity or expression, affectional or sexual orientation or differences in sex development. Uh, so our staff and commissioners use uh, these regulations uh, that recently became finalized as complaints are accepted, investigated, and adjudicated. So I'd like to take a moment just to highlight the journey that it's taken uh, to get to the, the both the state and federal protections before we talk in more practical terms about what discrimination looks like. Um, so you can see that they've been kind of on a parallel trajectory. Um, so in, in 2018, PHRC uh, adopted a guidance as, as a first step towards uh, codifying these protections. Uh, then in early 22, uh, 2022, the regulations were introduced, which went through a series of, uh, of approvals at the state level, and then they came into effect uh, in August 2023. Uh, at the federal level, the case of Bostock uh, versus Clinton County was an important step in establishing protections. So this was an employment case uh, where individuals were fired on the basis of their, their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, the Supreme Court uh, ruled that protections uh, based on sex include sexual orientation and gender identity. Uh, so just as uh, Neil Gorsuch wrote, uh, homosexuality and transgender status are inextricably bound up with sex, not because homosexuality or transgender status are related in sex in some vague sense, because discrimination on these bases has some disparate impact on one sex or another, but because to discriminate on these grounds requires an employer to intentionally treat individuals, uh, individual employees differently based on their sex. So then at the beginning of the Biden administration, President Biden issued an executive order 13988 entitled Preventing and Combating Discrimination on the Basis of Gender Identity or Sexual Orientation, which directed federal agencies to examine how their policy, uh, how, uh, that their policies are consistent uh, with this ruling. So HUD then issued a memorandum um, which stated that, uh, that HUD interprets the uh, the Fair Housing Act to bar discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity and directs uh, HUD offices and recipients of HUD funds to enforce that act accordingly. So Damon Smith, HUD's principal deputy general counsel, wrote uh, enforcing the Fair Housing Act to combat housing discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity isn't just the right thing to do. It's the correct reading of the law after Bostock. We're simply saying that uh, the same discrimination that the Sur Supreme Court has said is illegal in the workplace is also illegal in the housing market. So just some background to, to show you how um, there's consistency with uh, with the state and the federal um, interpretations of uh, uh, housing law. All right. And I wanna just touch on the guidance that, that predated PHRC's regulations. And the guidance said that this guidance is an exercise of authority granted to the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission to formulate policies to effectuate the purposes of the Human Relations, Pennsylvania Human Relations Act. Um, and nothing in this guidance shall uh, affect statutory or other regulatory uh, requirements. This guidance is neither an adjudication nor regulation. There was no intent for on the part of the commission to give this guidance that type of binding uh, force or effect. This guidance simply indicates the manner in which the commission indicates it's uh, to exercise its administrative discretion in accepting complaints, conducting investigations and adjudicating cases, unless it is convinced otherwise in the course of a, a specific proceeding. Commission, as in the past, remains committed to ensuring that the adjudicator uh, adjudicative determinations are made on a case-by-case -case basis after consideration of all evidence of record in the matter. And that guidance uh, defines sex as sex assigned at birth, sexual orientation, transgender identity, gender transition, gender identity, and or gender expression, depending on the individual facts of each case. Uh, but the regulation that followed was introduced in 2022 and received uh, approval from the IRRC and was published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin on June 17th in uh, 2023. It, uh, its effective date uh, is August 16th, 2023. 
And the final rule uh, form rulemaking provides clarity to ensure that the term sex as used throughout the PHRA and the PFEOA, including the provisions prohibiting discrimination in employment, housing, commercial property, public accommodations, and educational institutions is interpreted consistently. All right, so now we've covered the basics of fair housing, PHRC is as an agency, uh, the, the steps that have been taken uh, towards LGBTQ protections in housing. Now I wanna talk a little bit more in a, a practical sense about discriminatory actions and what that looks like. So you can see on the screen here a list of various discriminatory actions. Um, and I'm gonna provide some examples uh, of each of these. So discriminatory statements uh, might look like an advertisement that states that housing is only for heterosexual couples and, and no no good, uh, gay couples allowed, a, a statement that's clearly discriminatory. A discriminatory inquiry um, might uh, occur in the rental process as you're applying for a rental with your partner. And if the landlord asks, are you roommates or a couple? Um, and then you get denied the unit after answering that inquiry. Uh, steering might happen as you're talking to a leasing agent. So saying, you don't wanna live in that area of the housing complex. I think you'd be more comfortable over here with families like yours. Let me show you this unit instead. Uh, steering someone very clearly towards um, a certain neighborhood or, or a certain uh, area of a property. Uh, Refusal to sell, lease, or financing housing is relatively straightforward. So I'm not going to sell my home to you because of uh, your sexuality. I'm not going to rent this unit to you um, because you're you're transgender. Uh, predatory lending uh, might look like being targeted for a more expensive loan with higher fees, um, higher rates uh, because of your sexual orientation. Discriminating in terms and conditions. Um, that might look like having different terms in the lease about overnight guests, perhaps a, a higher rental rate. Unequal uh, provision of housing terms and conditions or uh, unequal provision of services and facilities. Uh, that might look like restricting access to some of the facilities, um, enforcing the lease terms differently than with other tenants. Uh, perhaps not providing uh, needed maintenance in a timely manner uh, because of uh, someone's gender identity. Uh, sexual harassment. Uh, this could either be a quid pro quo, which would be demanding sexual favors uh, for rent or maintenance services, a hostile environment, um, whether that's uh, a really severe incident or pervasive comments and actions uh, that make an environment that, that's really hostile to, uh, to the resident. Sexual harassment uh, can happen uh, from an owner, from a property manager, other staff members, contractors, or, or even, even other tenants. Uh, it often targets individuals who are really vulnerable and who don't have a lot of resources uh, or housing options. Um, it's often perceived as just being against women, but sexual harassment can happen to anyone. And then lastly, refusal to provide reasonable accommodation and modification. So individuals with disabilities have the right to request a reasonable accommodation or modification that they need to use and enjoy their housing. Um, a, request, uh, a request might be denied because the landlord doesn't want a tenant to continue to live there because of their sexuality. Uh, and if they would deny that uh, for a, a gay tenant with a disability, that would be discriminatory, potentially based on sex and disability. So sometimes when I give presentations like this, I get questions like, do these things actually happen today? Is that really what's happening in, in today's housing, uh, in today's housing situations? Um, here's just a couple quick data points uh, to, to illustrate that it is still a current issue today. Uh, there's a study by NCRC that found that same-sex borrowers uh, pay higher closing costs and higher rent interest rates uh, on average, than uh, different uh, different sex couples, uh, there's a higher rate of mortgage denials, and uh, homeownership rates are also lower for same uh, same sex couples than heterosexual couples. Uh, and this is based on the the uh, 
uh, HMDA data, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data. Uh, there's a study by the Urban Institute. They did uh, housing discrimination testing, which is kind of like secret shopping, uh, comparing the experience of gay men versus heterosexual men. And they found that gay men were told about fewer units, were less likely to get an appointment, and were quoted higher costs uh, for renting units. Uh, according to the National LGBTQ Task Force, uh, LGBTQ youth uh, were much more likely to experience homelessness and housing insecurity. 40% uh, of housing uh, homeless youth identify as LGBTQ. And then lastly, uh, in a study by NPR, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the Harvard Hughes Chan School of Public Health, 22% uh, of LGBTQ adults reported uh, experiencing discrimination in buying or renting a home. So yes, housing discrimination still does happen today. Um, so it's important that, uh, that we ensure that everyone is fully aware of their rights and know what to do uh, if they would experience housing discrimination. So what can you do? If you've experienced housing discrimination, you can contact our agency. Uh, our Fair Housing Line is listed right there on the screen, 855-866. Five uh, You can speak with uh, with a staff member who's well versed in fair housing law um, to to learn information. Um, you can also contact uh, local fair housing agencies. Pennsylvania uh, PHC has partnerships uh, with agencies uh, throughout the state uh, that can uh, help you understand your rights as well. If you'd like to file a complaint, you can get that started either by visiting our website and accessing one of our complaint forms, or you can call our intake team at 717-787-4410. Now, if you've uh, attended a PHRC training in the past, uh, you may be used to seeing a pretty detailed flowchart uh, at this point in the presentation. Um, uh, showing all of the, the steps in the complaint process and potential outcomes. But because uh, today our time is pretty brief, uh, we don't have uh, a lot of time. Uh, I'd like to just focus on the experience of the complainant, which is what we call the person who chooses to file uh, a fair housing complaint. So as I mentioned, if you believe you've experienced housing discrimination, your first step is to connect uh, with our intake team. And you have up to 180 days after the date of the last harm uh, to go ahead and file your complaint. That's about six months. Uh, so you'll be asked to fill out a housing questionnaire to provide your contact information, what you experienced, and who you're filing your complaint against. And uh, the intake team uh, will ask you some questions to assess your information to see if this is a situation that PHRC can, uh, can investigate under our laws. If it's determined that your complaint is jurisdictional and timely, uh, then the intake team will help you to finalize your complaint. And then the person that you file it against will be notified of that complaint. Uh, so you'll be asked to provide information to a neutral investigator who is responsible for investigating if there was a violation of our laws. That investigator may ask for documents uh, to interview witnesses, to hold a fact-finding hearing, or to seek other ways of obtaining evidence to determine what happened in that situation. Uh, they will also explore if it's possible to, to settle the case before coming to a finding. If the case does proceed to a finding, there are two possible outcomes, uh, probable cause, uh, where there's probable cause that discrimination occurred, or no probable cause no probable cause, where there is not enough information to determine that probable cause discrimination occurred. So if probable cause is found, the case might be conciliated, uh, it may advance to a public hearing or be filed in court. Uh, and at that point, the goal is to seek a remedy for the discrimination that occurred. Uh, the amount of time that it takes to investigate a case varies uh, based on the evidence, how speedy the response is, uh, are, and as well as other factors, we often get questions, well, how long will it take? And it's it's hard to put a direct timeline on it, um, but please know that it will be thoroughly investigated. So if you file a complaint, what are potential outcomes? 
um, if the if there's a, a settlement of conciliation or if it uh, proceeds to, to public hearing. There are a number of different remedies uh, that can be obtained. So um, if someone's denied housing or if there's an eviction process that was uh, preceded, they may be able to go ahead and purchase or lease that home or stop the eviction uh, that was in process with the impact of being that the complainant's able to obtain their housing and maintain their housing. If there was a reasonable uh, accommodation or modification request made that had been denied, well, then the remedy would be that the accommodation or modification is made, um, which means the complainant Sometimes there are issues in the, the policies or the lease uh, that are discriminatory. So the remedy would be to change those. Uh, so that way, both the complainant as well as other tenants uh, that that have uh, that use property uh, by the housing provider, they'll all have fair lease terms and policies. Sometimes uh, the posting of fair housing notices uh, is uh, is uh, agreed to in in the settlement, uh, and that ensures that uh, tenants and home buyers will have knowledge of uh, fair housing rights. Sometimes training is respond uh, is required for the respondents. Uh, which ensures uh, that respondents will have uh, full knowledge of their housing responsibilities uh, so they won't uh, reoffend. Um, PHRC does provide fair housing training. Sometimes there are fees uh, that might be charged by a housing provider, out of pocket expenses that are incurred during this process. Uh, so the remedy would be reimbursement of those. Um, because those are costs that they shouldn't have had to pay. And in housing cases, uh, money for humiliation and embarrassment uh, can be a, a remedy. Um, and the complainant would receive compensation for, uh, for costs that are associated with discriminatory actions. And lastly, if the case proceeds to, to, uh, to a public hearing, uh, civil penalties can be incurred. Um, and the respondent will, will pay the cost for violating our state laws. Here's a couple examples of what that uh, might look like. Um, $1.5 million. Uh, this is a situation in which a housing provider failed to provide accessible units and they ignored requests uh, for reasonable accommodations for tenants with disabilities. Uh, there was a $100,000 housing award uh, in which uh, a maintenance worker sexually harassed uh, a female tenant. There was a $90,000 award uh, in a situation where a housing provider revoked a lease and failed to address neighbor harassment based on race. And then a $77,000 award where a housing provider made discriminatory statements and refused to rent to a household uh, based on their familial status. All right. Uh, I don't want to leave you without providing some information about the fair housing resources that we can provide you um, as you go about your work. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, we, do have, we do have a fair housing line and we really encourage folks to use it as they have questions, as they encounter situations uh, that they're not sure about how to handle or what their rights are. Um, so again, that number is 855-866-5718. Uh, we can offer custom fair housing trainings and consultations uh, for housing providers, for municipal officials, for lenders, for realtors, for social service agencies, disability advocates, community members, and more. Uh, if you're someone that deals with fair housing in your work or life and you want information on, on specific fair housing topics or more general overviews, we're happy to provide that to you. Um, as part of our mission, uh, and you can reach out to me uh, for more information on that. Uh, we offer our monthly Fair Housing Empower Hour sessions, um, just like this one every month, uh, last Wednesday of the month, uh, except for I think this December because of the holiday, uh, the date shifted up a little bit, uh, but they cover various fair housing topics to ensure that everyone has, uh, has access to this information. We've got brochures, we've got uh, fact sheets, uh, other resources in print uh, that can be available to you. And the vast majority of these we have in both, both English and Spanish. 
Um, so if you want to request them, uh, we'd be happy to either ship out some hard copies or, or, or send you digital copies as well. And I also want to highlight uh, our PHRC Speaks Fair Housing in the 21st Century program, uh, which is uh, a program that, um, that discusses um, over fair housing um, and what individuals and organizations are doing throughout the Commonwealth to uh, to combat issues uh, that prevent people from having fair housing choice. Uh, it's every um, first Monday and third uh, every first and third uh, Sunday uh, at three o'clock on PC and TV uh, starting in November and running through March each year we're about to embark on our fifth season but you can always catch back episodes uh, on pcntv.com. Uh, the recordings are there as well. And I wanted to let you know that we do have a specific flyer that does outline our LGBTQ protections. Um, it covers the information that I covered here today, uh, but also uh, more broadly, because these protections extend beyond just housing, also in uh, employment, public accommodations, uh, educational uh, institutions as well. Um, so you can see the flyer on the screen. Uh, I will send a, a digital copy out uh, with this uh, presentation, but you can also request hard copy ones as well. And we're happy to provide those to you because we wanna make sure that this information gets out to community members so they understand uh, the rights and responsibilities. And that brings us to the end of our uh, uh, program today. Uh, I've got my contact info on there, so please reach out to me with any questions. Uh, you'll see a QR code on the screen. Please take a moment to uh, fill out a brief survey. It takes about three minutes to complete uh, to provide us some uh, some feedback on this presentation, what you liked about it, what you think could have been better, uh, topics that you'd really like to see on this Fair Housing and Power Hour series. We'd really love to uh, to hear what you have to say. And we've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, so if you have any fair housing topics, either on this specific topic, on other fair housing areas that you want information, uh, please feel free to either enter them into the chat uh, or to raise your hand um, and we can come off mute. So I've been keeping an eye on the chat. I don't think I've seen any questions here so far, um, but please uh, let me know. Uh, if you've got something that, that you uh, want to ask. I'm gonna give it another minute. All right, if we don't have any questions at this time, I'd like to thank you all for uh, for spending your lunch hour with me today uh, and encourage you to check out our upcoming uh, Fair Housing and Power Hours uh, next month using accommodations and modifications for individuals with disabilities. Uh, October or November, we're going to be uh, looking at fair housing for families. And then in December, uh, we are going to be uh, discussing fair housing for local governments. Uh, so thank you again, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.